I am super pleased to have back with us on the air Professor Stephen Cohen, contributing editor to The Nation, Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and Politics at NYU in Princeton, arguably one of the leading, uh, in my opinion, the leading Russian scholar in the United States, the author of Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives, among others. Uh, the, uh, in fact, you've got uh, your, your new book, or your most recent book, is The New Cold War. Do I have that right, Stephen? I'm still working on it. You're still working on it. Okay. Uh, and, and, and Professor Cohen. Uh, the website, of course, thenation.com. Uh, you can tweet him at the nation. Um, uh, Professor, welcome back to the program. I'm so pleased to have you with us. Thank you, Tom. I, I, the the issue of of Russia has so many different dimensions right now, and there is there is so much um, uh, some I think legitimate concerns, some I think demagoguery, some I think just you know political glad handing. Uh, there, there's so much going on on so many different levels. Uh, I'm rather than my trying to come up with a list of questions to to feed to you. I would like you to, if you don't mind, um, define what you think are the priorities that we're facing in the 45 minutes that we have to talk. We have a uh, every every uh, day at at uh, one one forty five. We have talk talk radio news that comes on to do a summary of the news events for the day. So we have until then. Um, uh, your thoughts on. Uh, in all these different areas where Russia is being discussed, what we should be looking at, what the story is behind the story, um, where our concerns should be, if I may. Tom, I'm, I'm happy to be back with you, particularly at this time, because um, you not only give me time to talk, but you create a discussion, which I think is important. And that doesn't happen very often on radio or TV. Uh, let me do what I've done before. Let me tell you what, where I think we are at in regard to Russia and related matters. I'll do that as quickly as I can, and then you decide what we should talk about. Okay. Uh, so I've said this before, but it must be emphasized. We are now in a new and more dangerous Cold War with Russia. It's been evolving. Some people think it began with the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, in 2014, but in the book you mentioned, uh, Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives, the subtitle, From Stalinism to the New Cold War, that book was published earlier than 2014. That is already, I was worrying, worrying nearly a decade ago about a new Cold War. That's a longer story that need not concern us, but since 2014, the new Cold War has evolved into at least three fronts that are fraught with hot war. That did not happen during the first Cold War. Those three fronts are surely, as your listeners and viewers know, Ukraine, uh, the Baltic region, where NATO is undergoing an unprecedented military buildup on Russia's western borders, and Syria, where literally uh, Russian and American planes are flying in the same airspace. So what we really should be doing in this country is discussing what we're going to do about this new and more dangerous Cold War. And what we have instead is a combination of first an absolutely bizarre and extraordinary demonization of Russia's leader, Putin. Oh, he assassinates journalists and invades countries and he disrupts our elections and he just does all sorts of gangster thug is the word people use about him. So, but, but there are assertions that all of those things are true. There are assertions, yeah. Assertions, allegation, assessment, but there are no facts. I mean, the Ukrainian invasion, as it's called, is, is, is a matter to discuss, but there is such a web of indictment of Putin that he poisoned some guy in London, that he killed journalists in Russia. No facts for this. But the problem is, is that we never had anything like this. A demonized Russian leader, not even a Soviet leader, certainly after Stalin, the strong implication and even assertion being we cannot deal with him even if it's in our national interest. Now we add to that the extraordinary phenomenon of the rise of President-elect Donald Trump. Uh, I could join you in an indictment of Trump, but not on the Russia issue. And what we're now having, and we've had since roughly last summer, toward the end of the 
Clinton campaign, because they introduced this theme into our mainstream discourse, the assertion, actually, that Trump is somehow either a Kremlin, a willing, knowing Kremlin agent, or, as we see from these tawdry documents released a couple of days ago, first by CNN, summarized, and then by BuzzFeed, that the Kremlin has on him such incriminating material that he will do the Kremlin's bidding when he is president. So here's where it stands. We have dire national security business with Russia that needs to be tended to in the American tradition, I would say, of Eisenhower, Nixon, and Reagan. They coped with this in what was called detente. Whether they did it well or badly is another question. We need to discuss it. But we are likely to end up with, in just over a week, a crippled national security president who, though he says he wants to work out cooperation with Putin for our sake, he says, will may be so crippled by these allegations that he has no political space to do something that's in our own national interest. For example, imagine John Kennedy in 1962, confronted with the Cuban Missile Crisis, and being daily, and not in marginal publications, but publications such as the New York Times and broadcasts such as CNN and MSNBC, Kennedy being called a Russian stooge or a Kremlin puppet. He would have had no space politically to negotiate wisely with Khrushchev, then the Soviet leader, to end the Cuban Missile Crisis short of nuclear war. That worries me a lot. Let me just add two or three things to this and I'll quit. This is unprecedented, Tom. Never in my lifetime, and maybe never in history, has an American president been called on a political network as influential as CNN, as did one of its paid consultants on air about a week ago, a Russian fifth columnist. Now, huh. younger listeners may not remember what fifth columnist meant in the 20th century. Not sure where the term came from, maybe the Spanish Civil War, but it means a person who is actively betraying, committing treason in his own country to the benefit of a foreign power. So Trump on CNN was called a Russian fifth columnist about a week ago, and there was a panel with a host. I think the panel had four people, but maybe three. And when this person said this, not one of the other people, not the host, not the other panelists, demurred in any way. No one said, well, wait a minute, that's a little much, or let's explore this discussion. But it's not unusual. There's an article in today's New York Times by Max Boot, not a regular New York Times contributor because he comes from the very hard conservative camp. So the editors made a decision. And it says that Trump has to prove that he is not a Kremlin agent. He has to prove it. Well, that's not the American way. We have something called the presumption of innocence. And though it's a, a term of jurisprudence, we usually try to pursue it in our political life as well. Well, beyond that, how does he prove it? By going to war with Russia? Well, that's the danger, isn't it? I mean, you can't prove, as people say, a negative. Right. I mean, I can sit here and say, well, you know, Tom Hartman's awfully friendly to me, and he puts me on. And I'm really wondering, yeah, I think he is. He's probably doing this at the Kremlin's bidding. And because some of my views... I assure are the, you that is not the case. <laughs> you, you can assure all you want, but right. then I will get the intelligence agencies, three of them, to produce an assessment, an assessment, whatever that is, right. that you're actually clearly operating at Putin's directives. And that will be on the front page of all the newspapers. Yeah. And you can deny it all you want, but the assessment's out there, and you can't really disprove it, right? So this is the dangerous situation. This is the situation Trump finds himself yeah, and in. Where is, what we do about it, what we talk about, is now your decision. Is, is well, and, 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 and I want to get to that. In fact, I, th I think probably the first question I want to ask right after this break is, is, is this the birth certificate? I mean, is this, basically, Trump spent eight years trying to, and in many ways successfully, delegitimizing President Obama by claiming that he wasn't a natural born citizen. 
um, is is the whole uh, Russia slash Putin thing slash Trump being used to try to delegitimize him? And what are the consequences of that? We'll be back with Professor Cohen. This is the Tom Hartman Program. I also commend to you uh, his most recent article in The Nation, Who Are the Real Enemies of U.S. National Security? You can read it at thenation.com. And welcome back. We're, we're talking with Professor Stephen Cohen, contributing editor to The Nation, his most recent piece, Who Are the Real Enemies of U.S. National Security? So, uh, Professor Cohen, your thoughts on my thought that, that um, at least one of the motivations, uh, I, I think there are some sincere people here who are concerned, um, et cetera, et cetera, you know, all the usual caveats, but I think that there's also uh, no shortage of, of partisans who are just licking their lips at, licking their chops at, hey, we can delegitimize Trump the same way he did Obama. It's like, you know, tit for tat. Your thoughts? Uh, let me revert to my uh, childhood. My mother was always telling me two wrongs don't make a right. What Trump did regarding Obama's place of birth uh, wasn't right. But we're in a different realm now. We're in a realm not of Trump security, but of our national security. So uh, I move on from that. I don't forget it, but I move on. Secondly, um, Trump is, after all, in a few days, the president of the United States. And the decisions he makes in the realm of national security uh, affect all of us. The word you used is very important, I think. This attempt, and I think it's more than an attempt, I think it's been successful, to brand Trump some kind of agent or puppet of the Kremlin is an effort to delegitimize him. And we might ask, though American politics is not my specialty, I can hardly avoid seeing what's around me, what are the motives of people who are doing this? And I think there are several. One, as you suggest, there's some payback in this. There is such a loathing for Trump among uh, segments, many people on the American political spectrum, led primarily by self-described liberals and progressives, but not only, that they desperately want to delegitimate, legitimize Trump for reasons of policy, payback, and general. The Clinton wing of the Democratic Party, and you know more about this than I do, so I'll just mention it because I think we ought to keep it in mind is now desperately trying to keep its hold on the Democratic Party, the hold it's exerted for nearly 25 years. Yeah, this is her, loss, her loss to Trump damages that. Personally, I think it's time for the Clintons to go and let the Democratic Party find its way without them. But uh, they are arguing that she didn't lose the election. It was stolen from her by Putin Trump. And that's driving some of this. But in Washington, D.C., in the Senate of the United States, in the newspapers, uh, in the political hub of Washington, the driving force to delegitimize Trump, which is coming equally from the Republican leadership in the Senate, is they fear he's serious about carrying out a new policy of cooperation or what we used to call detente with Russia. Well, it, very, if I may interrupt real quickly, um, when, Ob when Obama became president, he said he was going to reboot the policy. In fact, Hillary Clinton went over there with the reboot button. Um, when George W. Bush became president, he said he was going to reboot our policy with Russia. Why is it that Donald Trump saying he wants to reboot our policy with Russia is so different? We're, hi we're hitting a break. I'm sorry. I let me ask you that question again when we come back from the break, if I may. And, and my apologies for interrupting your thought. We'll be right back. We're talking with Professor Stephen Cohen. We're talking with Russia expert Professor Stephen Cohen, contributing editor to the nation, his most recent piece, Who Are the Real Enemies of U.S. National Security? You can read it at um, his book, Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives. Professor Cohen, um, the, 60, the reporter link has just released a survey. I just got this like 40 minutes ago in, uh, in, May, in email. 60% of Americans are scared of Trump's strong ties with Putin and Russia. And 57% uh, of Americans agree with President Obama's sanctions against Russia, uh, et cetera. The, 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 public, 
the public is is going in this direction. Anyhow, you you were you were making a point, and I I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Um, you want to get back to where where you were? Yeah, I should just say that I looked at uh, polls, polling of American attitudes toward Russia, Soviet Russia, and post-Soviet Russia over several decades. Mm -hmm. They they essentially reflect reflect the clamor of what the American political elite or class or media uh, are saying. Right. So you noticed, for example, that there was this upsurge in Republican admiration for Putin. I mean, it's kind of funny. And that was came, was coming from Trump supporters who were simply reacting to Trump's remark that Putin's a strong leader and we should work with him. So you immediately get from almost 0% of Republicans who think there's something positive about Putin to nearly 30%. Uh, any president, we know this from the history of detente, can turn around American opinion. So that takes us to your question before. Detente, moving from very bad Cold War to a more cooperative relationship to avoid conflict uh, with Russia, has a long history. Uh, Eisenhower did it with Khrushchev in dangerous times, and detente failed. Uh, it was sabotaged, I think, by the famous U-2, the shootdown of the U-2 plane, right. which reminds us that detente has very strong enemies, always has had, both in Washington and in Moscow. So any pro president who undertakes a policy of detente has to be able to be prepared to fight politically in this country and fight wisely. Then came Nixon and Kissinger with a much larger and I think not terribly well-conceived policy of detente, but was ambitious. And it failed or ended, though it had a lot of successes, essentially due to the importance of the issue of Jewish immigration um, from the Soviet Union and eventually with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. But that was after Nixon, of course. And then came Reagan, and he carried out the most successful detente in history, he was so successful that when Reagan left office in January uh, 1989, he wrote in his diary, we, meaning he and Soviet leader Gorbachev, have ended the Cold War. They believe the Cold War was over. That's that. What, now, the, the odd thing is Trump never points out that in proposing a detente, he's in a Republican, not Democratic tradition. Eisenhower, Nixon, and Reagan were Republicans. Never once did Trump say that in campaigning or since. I don't understand why. Hmm. He's taking all this flack for proposing a more cooperative policy with Russia, and yet he's in the tradition of Republican president. So now I come to your question. Uh, Bush, the relationship between Bush and Obama, uh, Putin was completely different. Putin did more in the aftermath of 9-11 to help American forces fight a war in Afghanistan to oust the Taliban than any leader in the world. I could itemize and maybe amaze you. Yeah, although we'd with, have just a minute to the break. So. With all, all Putin did. But in return, he was essentially betrayed by Bush, betrayed by Bush, humiliated in Moscow. So that's a lesson to be learned. And what Obama did with his so-called reset, his word for detente, was ill-conceived from the beginning. It was based on the premise, Russia gives and we take. It was. I wrote an article the day he announced it, and I saw the, the contours of it, and I said, this is going to fail, and it did. So it, in some ways, there are lessons to be learned for Trump, mainly, mainly negative lessons, but a way to go forward if he really wants to. Right. But will he be able to if he, if he has been delegitimized just by that association? Well, that's what I asked you when we began to talk. Yeah. I mean, the short answer is he needs a really strong pro detente team around him. That is, above all, a national security advisor, a secretary of state, and an ambassador to Moscow. Who, who are who are on that page, on a detente page. That's what Reagan, I do remember, by the way, that Reagan was denounced by his own party for pursuing detente with Gorbachev. You're right. He said the Cold Warrior had betrayed the entire cause. You're right. You're absolutely he, right. He, uh, he Professor Cohen, we'll be, we'll be right back. It, we're, we're hitting a break here. Um, hang on. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 202-808-9925. Professor Stephen Cohen with us. We'll be back in six minutes after the break at the news at the bottom of the hour. Uh, who are the real enemies of U.S. national security? It's in The Nation right now, thenation.com.
Uh, with us is Professor Stephen Cohen, uh, contributing editor to The Nation, uh, author of Who Are the Real Enemies of U.S. National Security, a new article over at The Nation I strongly uh, commend to you. Uh, also his book, Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives. Um, and uh, Professor Cohen, uh, somebody just called and, and asked the question, why is Trump so close to Putin? Um, first of all, that, that question belies a perception that uh, may or may not be real. Um, and, but secondly, uh, you know, I, I toss it to you as a question. Well, the answer is, if close means having some kind of personal relationship with Putin or people who represent Putin uh, that we should worry about in the sense that Trump may not do what is in the best interest of the United States. There is zero evidence for that. Zero. Absolutely zero. If you mean why does Trump's thinking about national security parallel Putin's thinking about the need for a partnership between the United States and Russia, the answer would be because many of us think that, and that is a correct, correct orientation. Uh, I believe and have long believed that Putin or whoever sits in the Kremlin is potentially the single most important national security partner for American national security, and that we've squandered that, that opportunity repeatedly. I believe, as was true during the Soviet era, that the road to American national security runs through Moscow. Presidents have acted on that, most recently Reagan, of course. But if we're talking about these allegations that Trump has clandestine conspiratorial ties to Putin. There is zero evidence, zero, yeah. that I know of that's been presented to me. Remind, remember, Tom, and to get this out of the way, the three leading intelligence agencies produced a report, public report, uh, on the hacking. And it said, this report, the use of the CIA, the FBI, and the uh, NSA, that Putin personally had directed a campaign to hack the Democratic National Committee, use the incriminating materials against Ms. Ms. Clinton, Mrs. Clinton, and put Trump in the White House. In that report, in that report, there was not one single fact, not one. Even the New York Times, which is down with this whole orientation, said in its analysis on the front page of the paper, written by Scott Shane, I think, that it was gravely disappointing that the agencies had produced no evidence whatsoever, no proof. The only thing in there was a long denunci denunciation of the Russian-sponsored international English language network, RT, which was ludicrous. I mean, RT is just another international state-sponsored network presenting its point of view and all the rest. But even the report on RT was like two or three years old. Some of the, sh the shows, the broadcast that the intelligence agency said had promoted Trump's victory, either had been anti-Trump or off the air for two years. It was a total embarrassment. Uh, and there's an article about that in The Nation right now as well, by the way. People can read it at thenation.com. Yeah, by the way, if you want a sarcastic reply to this of how these intelligence agencies could have produced a report so embarrassing in regard to their own abilities, so politicized, so empty, joining in the practice of blaming Putin for everything, and with sarcasm intended, I think Putin took over the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA years ago. He's running them and forced them to produce this report, which utterly discredits American intelligence no, I, re I realize that's sarcasm, uh, Professor, but, you know, we have to be very careful. Uh, anything you say on the air will probably be clipped out and used out of context. So, please. Well, of course, the other thing that, that the report did was give an enormous promotional boost to the Russian network RT, right. which is scarcely seen in cable in the United States because few major cable companies will carry it. Now lots of people are going to know what's on this. What's on this network that has changed the fate of America politically? I mean, right. the whole thing was so counterproductive to the intelligence agencies, you wonder. But if we, do we have a minute left? Let's go. We have five minutes left. So where do we go from here? So let's go to the elephant in the room, and or what elderly Jews used to say, the excrement and the bar mitzvah punch bowl. Uh, you and I inhabit something roughly called the liberal progressive uh, political community in the United States. 
And indeed, I am married to one of the most prominent figures of that community, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, the editor of The Nation. And the liberal progressive community is extremely angry, disgusted uh, with Trump. It will. It is saying he's a fascist and various things like that. I don't care for this because I think, and I, everybody uses this word, but I think we're in an existential moment with Russia, in grave danger, that we have to focus on our national security. I don't know that Trump will do the right thing. I don't know if he's smart enough. I don't know if he has the advisors around him. But I know two things, that detente, more cooperation with Putin's Russia is first possible, and secondly, for the sake of us all, utterly necessary. So my position today is I will certainly support a President Trump, as I did a President Reagan, whom I had voted against twice, if he adopts a policy of detente with Russia. The rest of his policies one can remain in opposition to, but this really is existential, and it's, uh, it's causing a lot of ill temper in the liberal progressive community, and people don't want to hear or think about this, this issue. But I am adamant. I've never seen anything as dangerous for us in my lifetime. And if we send Trump tarred, defamed, crippled, wounded by the allegation that he is a Russian fifth columnist sitting in the White House, therefore a traitor, that's what that means, committing treason, then we may be doomed. Who's going to save us if there's another Cuban Missile Crisis? Who? Right, and nuclear That's winter true. might well mean the end of the human race. You know, Gorbachev once echoed Hillel, the Jewish philosopher, when he was trying to reform the Soviet Union and shouted at his opponents in the Communist Party, uh, if not now, when? If not us, who? That's the kind of situation we're in with Russia today. If we don't do something to reduce this Cold War now, and if we don't find somebody to do it, and the only person we have at the moment is Donald Trump, well, answer the question yourself. Yeah, yeah. Now, so, that's, that's so, a part of how you feel about CNN and BuzzFeed dumping this so-called intelligence compromising material against Trump into the mainstream a couple of days ago. By the way, I've traveled in and out of Moscow for years. I've been in archives. I've seen trash like this. I know how this was compiled. It's for sale or for leak. Uh, this is a, this is something that American political operatives and Russian political operatives have in common. I guess we call it opposition research. Well, in something. fact, it was apparently paid for by one of the Republican uh, people, one of the Republicans who was running against Trump in the primary. Seems to have been Rubio, but I'm not sure. And then when he was knocked out, the Clinton campaign bought this guy who was producing it. I mean, but the question isn't, I mean, clearly the stuff, the point is, is that when this kind of stuff becomes mainstream, we're in Soviet and even modern day Russian territory because this is done in Moscow to destroy political opponents, uh, sexual improprieties, financial improprieties. Let me give you one example. I'm not a Trump supporter, have no tie to Trump, wasn't a Clinton supporter, no tie to Clinton. I'm a supporter of American national security. Trump's, one of his sons is always quoted almost daily as having said a few years ago, there are, we find there are a lot, a lot of Russian money in our businesses. And of course there were. After the end of the Soviet Union, and I observed this closely, suddenly rich cash-bearing Russians came to buy co-ops and condos in New York and Florida in particular. And since they had cash, they didn't need mortgages. Every real estate agent wants a buyer who doesn't need a mortgage. These people were loaded, paid in cash, and the one brand they knew in Russia was Trump. It's a glittery brand, glittery brand and all new, rich, newly rich Russians. So they were buying, buying glitter. condos in Trump Tower. That's what he was talking about? Not only there, but down where I live briefly, in Hollywood, Hollandale, Florida, that's just north of Miami Beach, I mean, there are so many Russians down there. Right. And one for a decade, and lots of them living in Trump, you know, franchised condos and co-ops. I mean, 
this was a perfectly legitimate business. I mean, every realtor was chasing these people. It's just that Trump had this glitzy name. So we need to go to the real issues. Is he right or is he wrong on national security issues? And we will see what he offers. But I come back, it's going to be a fight. If, you, if you're for detente, it's going to be a hell of a fight. It's going to be a bloodbath. And we'll see whether he can manage it. We'll see what Putin's response is. And above all, we'll see the quality of the men or women that Trump puts around him in his national security team who know how to do this. I have some doubts whether these people, they need to study what Reagan did, for example, if they want to learn from history. Again, Reagan was horribly opposed in his own party when he stretched his hand to Gorbachev. Casper uh, Weinberger, I believe, his secretary of defense said, Mr. President, I have to quit. And Reagan seems to have said, well, Caspi, we sure are going to miss you around here. Reagan just pushed on. Mm. That's what has to do. That's what Trump will have to do, because it will be a political bloodbath in this country. Remarkable. Remarkable times we live in. Professor Stephen Cohen, contributing editor to The Nation, uh, his most recent piece for The Nation, Who Are the Real Enemies of U.S. National Security? You can read it at thenation.com. It's also a great piece about RT over there. And uh, uh, Professor Cohen, thank you. And his book, uh, Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Professor. We'll be back. You're listening to Tom Hartman. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. That was Professor Stephen Cohen and uh, TheNation.com.